unity. Give us understanding as we think together and talk together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We've been looking at the background of the study of apocalyptic, the reasons for belief in God, the divisions of theology. We notice that two of the divisions of theology have been reserved for close attention to our own day. And that's very important because the Lord has a timetable and the fact that eschatology and pneumatology have only come into their own in this age means the time has come for the fulfilment of eschatology by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's very important to realise that those seven divisions, it's only very recently that close attention has been given to the study of the Holy Spirit and the study of the last things. We're going to begin our look at the book of Revelation. It is the seal of Scripture. In it, all the books of the Bible meet and end. You can preach the whole Bible from Genesis onwards just with the book of Revelation. Every theme, every promise, every hope, every dream found in the Old Testament reappears in the book of Revelation. Genesis is the seed plot of the Bible. Revelation is the flower bed. All the truths in seed in Genesis grow up in Revelation. Genesis 1 begins with a new heavens and a new earth. Revelation finishes with a new heavens and a new earth. Genesis begins with a man made in the image of God who has his bride and it closes with man restored to the image of God as the bride of Christ. Begins with a day followed by a night, it ends with a day that will know no night. It begins with paradise and it ends with paradise. The third chapter from the beginning of the Bible, Satan enters, sin enters, the curse enters, death enters. The third chapter from the end of the Bible, third last chapter of Revelation, Satan is no more, sin is no more, the curse is no more, death is no more. It's though we've been travelling on a golden ring and come right back to where we started. The four Gospels tell us about the head of the church. The epistles tell us about his body, that is his church. And remember by church we mean the church invisible, not a denomination as such. Christ only has one bride, all those that know and love him, whether they're Catholic or Protestant, whether they're dispensationalist or non-dispensationalist, whoever. If they know him and love him, they're members of his body. So the epistles talk about the body of Christ, the church. The Gospels, the head. In Revelation, the two come together. The Gospels talk about the atonement, which brings out justification, whereby God can look about, look upon guilty, sinful people like you and me and deal with us as though we're perfect. Justification means being declared righteous, even though we're not. As Christ was declared sin, even though he was not. Plenty of seats down the front, folks. So the Gospels tell us the atonement that brings out justification. The epistles talk much about that, but also go on to enlarge on sanctification. Seats here. When we get to the book of Revelation, we have glorification. Now remember, we have sin upon us as guilt, sin over us as a tyrant, and sin in us as a traitor. Every one of us. Sin upon us as guilt. Sin over us as a tyrant. We all do lots of things we didn't think we would ever do. And we don't seem to get over it too easily. And sin in us is a traitor. You're not human if you haven't looked in the mirror and asked yourself, did you do that? Did you say that? You know, we are all like someone that's a big omnibus with all our ancestors in the bus and every now and again one puts his head out the window. <laughs> that, that's all of us. So the problem of sin is sin is a burden upon us. That's guilt. Sin is a tyrant over us. And then sin is a traitor within us. And the Bible deals with it by justification. That gets rid of our guilt. Even though I'm still a sinner, even though every time I pray the Lord's Prayer, I must say, Lord, give me my daily bread and forgive me my trespasses. There never comes a time when you don't need to pray the Lord's Prayer. 
The Christian hates sin, fights sin, confesses sin. The Christian does not encourage sin, does not condone sin, fights with all his might, but the nearer he gets to Christ, or she gets to Christ, the more sinful they appear to themselves. So, justification deals with the guilt, and begins the battle against the tyranny of sin, because once you see Christ, he's worth more than everything else the devil can offer. So that breaks the tyranny. But the working out of that breaking is what we call sanctification, which means becoming holy. We're counted holy the moment we believe. This is very important because suppose you're a new Christian and you've been very profane, bad-tempered, short fuse, and you're going to church and another driver does a typical Australian thing in driving and you put your head out and describe his ancestry and then you say, <laughs> you say, I am supposed to be a Christian and look what I've said, see? And then you're hit by another Australian from behind <laughs> and you're gone. You've had no time to confess, lost or saved. <laughs> Lost or saved. See, the good news of the gospel is that when you're declared righteous, that covers the past, the present, and the future. You don't have to have a good memory to be saved. I confess my sins, I go along. I can't remember them all at night time. <laughs> See? So it's very important we understand that the moment we accept Christ, we have the decree of the last judgment, we're justified. We have the verdict of the last judgment. We have eternal life. John 5.24 says both of these things. He that believeth doesn't come into condemnation, has eternal life. John 5.24. The moment we believe, that coverage is for the future as well as the past, provided we are still trusting in Jesus Christ. God leaves us free to turn our back and, and walk away, but that's a very rare thing for a converted Christian. It's a very common thing for many people who profess to be Christian. Very rare thing for people who have been truly converted. So that's justification, covers everything. Your salvation doesn't depend on a fluke of the clock. Did I have a chance to confess? You know, some people's life is, is like the old yo-yo. They're in Christ, out of Christ, in Christ, out of Christ. That's just not true. Once you've chosen him as yours, you know he's accepted you as his for keeps. For keeps provide you maintain your faith in him, you see. So that's justification. Sanctification is making real in us is what he's declared as true about us. So righteousness adheres, justification, righteousness inheres, sanctification. Righteousness is a making righteous. So there's one that's a title to heaven, justification. There's one that's a fitness for heaven, that's sanctification. But the moment you're justified, God counts you fit. The thief on the cross didn't have much sanctification, six hours. So most has got more time than that. But he was promised paradise. So my making it doesn't depend on whether I've achieved perfect patience. If so, I never will make it. It doesn't depend on my having perfectly unselfish love. If so, I'll never make it. There are no perfect people. There are no perfect husbands, wives, sons, daughters, grandparents. There's just nobody perfect. The Bible says, in many things we all offend. James 3 and verse 2. All have sinned, that's the past. All fall short of the glory of God. That's present continuous. But the good news of the gospel is that despite my fumbling, bumbling, erring, frequent fallings short, I'm accepted in the beloved, I'm complete in him, and death has no fears, nor the judgment, because I have the verdict of the last judgment, and I have eternal life. So sanctification makes me fit for heaven even though legally I'm fit the moment I believe. But it begins the process. It's climaxed by glorification, a theme that few people seem to understand. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54 says this corruptible must put on incorruption. See, many of our sins grow from the fact that we are deficient. Our memories fail. Our perceptions are not always accurate. When Christ said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he was saying a lot of people do wrong without knowing they're doing wrong. And when I say a lot, I mean everybody, the lot. We all do wrong without knowing it's wrong. See? So the time comes when this corruptible body, which is partly to blame, partly to blame for our mistakes, must be changed. This corruptible puts on incorruption, this... This mortal puts on immortality. So glorification is when we're restored to the image of our maker. So the righteousness of justification is 100%, but it's not inside us. 
It's where it's safe, in him. The right of sanctification is inside, but it's never 100%. So you never put your trust in how well you're doing, because if you're honest, the answer is rotten, dreadful, horrible. So you never put your trust in how you're doing. The righteous inside us is never 100%. The righteous glorification will be both 100% and inside us. You got it? Justification, 100%, but outside of us. It's in Christ. When we claim by faith, it's attributed to us, counted to us, reckoned to us, imputed to us. That's justification. Sanctification, the righteousness is inside us because the Spirit comes. He changes our tastes. Lots of things I could do in my early teens I could no longer do. Seats down here, plenty of them. So the Holy Spirit comes and changes our desires, changes our likings and our dislikes. That's sanctification. It means an increasing prayerfulness, whereby prayer becomes as spontaneous as breathing. You don't wait to kneel at night. That's a terrible long time to lay your prayers. You pray as you go along, mainly very brief prayers, very, very brief. Lord, guide, Lord, help, Lord, forgive, Lord, direct. You know, very brief staccato prayers. So sanctification, increasing prayerfulness, increasing humility as we learn more of the truth about ourselves. But an increasing growth in faith and hope and love. Glorification where our whole nature's changed. And we won't have to say with Paul, wretched man that I am, who'll deliver me from this body of death? He'll do it at the coming. Until then I have temptation from without and far worse than the temptation from without, temptation from within. Every normal person has nonsensical impulses, foolish inhibitions, obscene images. These are normal in sinful people, and we've all got them. It's often been said the devil tempts people, but most people tempt the devil. That's because of what we are. See, glorification fixes that. So the Gospels present the atonement that brings justification. The epistles present sanctification as well but revelation is going to dwell on glorification it's going to be the day when all things are well and all things are very well and death is no more and sorrow and sighing will flee away and God wipes away all tears from their eyes and we meet our lost loved ones and we come from the tomb if we've gone it's a funny thing we all know everybody else is going to die we find a very difficult thing we will die uh, Sorokin a great American novelist as he got very very old was interviewed he said well I knew everybody died but somehow I thought God would make an exception in my case <laughs> and most of us think like that but there are no exceptions as in Adam all die the only exception those alive when Jesus comes they're the only exceptions you see so revelation points forward to that great day when evil will be no more the book is tremendously important would you look with me at the first chapter And the first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That ought to tempt us to it, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear. The words is probably, and keep those things that are written therein. The time is at hand. This is the only book in the Bible where a special blessing is pronounced on the study of it. Seats down the front. The only book in the Bible with a special blessing pronounced on its study. And because we're dull of hearing, look at the last chapter, if you would. In this last chapter 2, verse 7, Behold, I come quickly, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So the beginning and the end, there's a special blessing for attention to this book that we're attending to in these weeks. A special blessing. No other book in the Bible like that. Isn't it strange? The two things where Christ has commanded us to study and understand are the most neglected in Christianity. Matthew 24, 15. When you see the abomination of desolation, whoso readeth, let him understand. I've told you my experience 30 years ago at Manchester University, about to spend years just eating, thinking, sleeping, the abomination of desolation. 
even working on it in church when the preacher was dull or when he was interesting. I was still on the abomination of desolation, you know. But when I surveyed the libraries of the world, there wasn't one book on the topic. Now, lots of little articles. I could have written the articles in my sleep, but there were no books on it. And yet Christ says, whoso readeth, let him understand. You must understand this prophecy. And yet it's neglected. We've got miles of books on the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer, the miracles, the parables, miles of books. Not one book on that topic. See? And here's the other one, and let me tell you something about this. Because this book is so important, the devil attacks it very strongly. R.H. Charles, who was one of the greatest scholars in apocalyptic, said it's been admitted from the beginning of the Christian era that this is the most difficult book in the Bible. Archdeacon Woodhouse, a very great scholar, long, long ago, said there have been many commentaries written on this book, but they never convinced the majority of readers. Dr. South said the study of Revelation either finds or leaves the person mad. Will you come back in two weeks' time? <laughs> either finds or leaves a person mad. But God says, blessed is he, and repeats it. Blessed, blessed, see? Luther was hostile to this book. He said, Christ isn't known or recognised. Now, great men make great mistakes. Great men come up with great heresies. You know, Calvin came up with a terrible heresy, predestination, whereby God only smiled upon a few and from eternity said, only these will be saved, the rest are damned. Now, that's a pretty awful heresy. It denies John 3.16. God so loved the world. It denies 1 John 2.2. 2. He's a propitiate for our sins, not our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. But that was John Calvin. Wonderful, wonderful man wrote commentaries on pretty well every book of the Bible, preached about every day of the week, taught regularly, had every disease in the book. Spurgeon reckoned <laughs> with his tongue in cheek, Spurgeon reckoned with his tongue in cheek that Calvin had 88 diseases when he died. He worked too hard. It's hard for us to believe God's a kind master. We all are inclined to overdo it. We teach righteousness by faith and we live righteousness by works. And Calvin was a mighty hard work, but... He wouldn't write a commentary on this book, but someone said shrewdly, thereby he showed his great good sense <laughs> for the reason that uh, was given by uh, Charles, R.H. Charles. It's the most difficult book, you see. Zwingli said it's an intrusion into the canon. shouldn't be there. On the other hand, men like uh, Charles Erdman, who wrote a commentary, he said no book is so full of practical help for the Christian. No book is so imperishable as this one. Campbell Morgan said this book is the celestial capstone of the Bible Leon Morris great Australian scholar said this book presents the true theology of power in a generation that's mad about power the greatest commentator who ever lived Christopher Wordsworth cousin to the poet if you can get his commentary it's worth a king's ransom Christopher Wordsworth He said, every word in this book is written with great precision as though it was first weighed in a balance before it was put down. The average pastor says, my flock say we don't understand a word of it, but let's have a shot at it. That's what the average pastor says. A great scholar at Manchester University, G.B. Caird, said, No other book's been so loved and so hated. He said it's the inspiration of music, art, poetry. It's the fountain of love and devotion. It's the comfort of the bereaved. It's the strength of the persecuted. All that is true. Spurgeon said a very sensible thing. He said... uh, The harder the shell, the sweeter the nut. The more difficult the scripture is, the sweeter it is when we understand it. Great German scholar Hengstenberg says, it doesn't torment you, it doesn't bless you. And another great scholar, Bengal, said, it wasn't written without tears, and neither without tears can it be understood. Remember in Revelation 5, John says, I wept much. I wept much the book has been more abused than any other Bible book 
how Lindsay became a very, very wealthy man by writing a book on Revelation called The Late Great Planet Earth. Come right in, Greg. There's seats here. One here, two here, two seats here. How Lindsay wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth, which no New Testament scholar in the world today believes is worth reading. But it sold over 30 million copies. 30 million copies. As a journalist, and with the help of a journalist, Hal Lindsay took notes from uh, a dispensational seminary and put them in popular language, and it sold over 30 million copies. But not an accepted New Testament scholar in the world thinks that book is worth reading. So this book has been more abused than any other book. It's been used as hate literature against the Roman Catholic Church. That's a very wrong use of it. And by some Catholics, it's been hate literature against Luther and co. And that's also a wrong use of it. So it's a book that's been terribly abused, but there's a legal maxim, and some of you here will understand this better than me. Abuse never cancels use. No perversion has been permitted by providence to lessen the importance and the power of this book over the Christian's heart, mind and conscience. Thomas Aquinas, great Catholic scholar, gave a reason for much of the abuse of this book. He said, if an ass looks into a book, you can't expect an angel to look out. <laughs> so in other words, what you and I bring to the study of a book often determines what we get out of it. See? And we're going to spend a few minutes on what I would call the hermeneutic of Revelation, which means the principles of interpreting. I have handled pretty well every book on the book of Revelation that's in the Library of Congress, and that has hundreds and hundreds of books ranging over centuries. Before I wrote my own commentary on Revelation 20 years ago, and I was given leave from the college for a few months, I went to the Library of Congress and spent time with pretty well every book there. But the majority of them are quite worthless because they're based on a false hermeneutic. Hermeneutic means the science of interpretation. You know, I first began to study this book over 60 years ago and it nearly drove me crazy. It gave me nightmares. I was only a kid. And I, I read about these, this terrible woman on a fierce beast and horrible plagues of darkness and water turning to blood and my mind just swirled, see? And I missed what it was about. I missed it completely. And I remember 10 years after that beginning to write on prophecy and in the merciful kindness of God after having written some I put it away and said I don't know enough. <laughs> that was a mercy. And then since then I have... Uh, spend a long time to start with and doing degrees on this topic which is no guarantee of the outcome but it does mean some work has been done. So we're going to spend a little time on how to interpret the book and then you using these principles may come up with a better understanding of the book than I do or anyone else. So here are the principles of hermeneutics. Every Bible book had a meaning for the people who first received it. How Lindsay behaves as though the book of Revelation was let down about 1960 at the time of the Israeli Six-Day War and it was main, written mainly for Americans and mainly the dispensationists among the Americans. But every Bible book had meaning for the, book, for the people who first received it. The whole book of Revelation made sense to the first Christians that's very important to understand. Every Tom, Dick and Harry, every Linda and Ian and Joel and Rita and Lloyd and Keith, Jen and May, everyone in the early Christian church could catch the drift of what this book was saying. The book wasn't just written for the 21st century. Every Bible book made sense to the people who first received it. That's rule number one. Secondly, it's literature, so you have to ask what sort of literature. When you read the book of Isaiah, it says, uh, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, 
And then another picture of the new earth that says, no lion shall be there. So the atheist said, there you are, another contradiction. The Christian says, no, you know nothing about literature. Poetry uses images, uses metaphors. No lion as a lion shall be there. No ravenous beast will be there, but lions will be there. So when we understand that Isaiah's poetry, and if you have a modern Bible, it will set out most of the prophets in poetry, because they are largely poetry, see? Now this book is what is known as an apocalypse, an apocalypse. The very first word after the article V says the revelation, Greek word apocalypsis, which means a symbolic picture of truths, a symbolic picture of truths. So this is a symbolic book. When we read of a scarlet-dressed woman holding a golden cup, riding a beast with seven heads, don't ask yourself what John had been eating and drinking before he wrote that. Say, what do these symbols mean? What do these symbols mean? When the 19th chapter he pictures Christ coming on a white horse, don't ask yourself well, what sort of stables has they got up yonder and do they only have Arab steeds? Say, so what does this mean? And he pictures Christ coming with a sword coming out of his mouth. Is he a sword swallower? Or well, what does it mean? See, so n- number one, first hermeneutic, the book made sense to the people that received it. Number two, it's a book of symbols. Number three, the symbols are found in the Old Testament and we must go there for its meaning. This book is a mosaic of the Old Testament. It has approximately 550 references to the Old Testament. You can hardly find a verse that doesn't have its roots in the Old Testament. Notice with me, if you would, at the end of chapter 1 of Revelation... Verse 20, well, 19, write the things thou hast seen. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So uh, the seat down here, is anyone sitting by an empty one? Oh, two there, good. So John has seen a vision of candlesticks. And he's seen Christ walking among, not candlesticks all attached, as in the Jewish temple, but separate candlesticks. Christ is walking among them. And he's told these candlesticks represent seven churches. And and the, the stars represent the angels. The word angel, angelos, means a messenger. And it was often applied to the messengers of the churches, the pastors. So right at the end of the first chapter, the angel says to John, now look, what I'm showing you is a lot of symbols. And each symbol has a meaning. The stars represent leaders, messengers, angels. The candlesticks represent the churches. Now it's important to note that this chapter is permeated by the theme of light. For example, if you would look verse 12, the candlesticks of light. Then in verse 14, the Son of Man has hair white like wool, white as snow, eyes as a flame of fire, feet like under fine brass, as if they burnt in the furnace. Has in his right hand seven stars. See, light, light, light. The book enters with a reference to light, like the beginning of Genesis. Genesis opens with darkness upon the face of the deep and God said, let there be light. Light. So this book will tell us about life. Life is full of darkness, sin, evil, sorrow, heartbreak, frustration, pain, death. This world is full of darkness. Every life is. I've said to you before, the normal person has considered suicide at least once by the age of 40. At least once. It's a good idea never to make a big decision in a hurry, especially that decision. I doubt there's anyone in this room that hasn't sometimes wished they were dead. I have on a number of occasions. But you must never make big decisions in a hurry. 
Nightmares never last. That's good, isn't it? Nightmares never last. The blackest night gives way to a morning. The most cruel winter is displaced by spring. Death is followed by resurrection. And God has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. And in every difficulty, he has his way prepared to bring relief. So this book is trying to tell us that, that the God who spoke light out of darkness in Genesis is going to bring everlasting light into this world. And when we get to the end of the book, he'll say the city has no temple therein, for the Lord God and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city has no need of the light, for the Lamb is the light thereof. So light is the great theme. And over and over again, when we get to chapter 6, we'll see a, a white horse. The Greek really means glowing, glistening. The Greek word is only used for heavenly things. A horse that personifies light. And it's a symbol of the army of Christ going forth to present the gospel of light. When you get to chapter 12, there's a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Light, light, light. See? So right from the beginning, we notice symbolism in this book and light is a prominent symbol stars candlesticks beasts all sorts of symbols like that the next thing to emphasize is the symbols are mainly jewish that is they come from the old testament remember our lord said salvation is of the jews every writer of the bible was a jew except luke from the jews came our savior from the Jews came the first apostles. So when Jesus said salvation is of the Jews, he meant the Old Testament revelation. And all the symbols of this book come from there. But when they reach us, they are now baptized into the Christian church. They no longer have their limited local Jewish meaning. And this is where the dispensationalists, many of whom are very saintly, and very wonderful Christians whose shoe latches I am not fitted to attach. Many wonderful people among this dispensations. But they're dead wrong when they use this book to teach that it's about literal Israel, the Jews. I need to remind you, most modern Jews are atheists. Only a small percentage of Jews are orthodox and believe the Bible, the Old Testament. Most are atheists. If you knew the story of how the state of Israel was founded, and some of you do, it's a horrible story about assassinations, about bloodshed, about blowing up King David Hotel, murdering people. What a way to bring in a new state by murder. I'm not being anti-Semitic. The Jew is no worse than the Australian, and no better. But it is a wrong use of the Bible to take the prophecies of the New Testament and treat the symbols as though they're still literal. All the Jewish symbols found in this book are Christianized. So now Israel in this book is the church. Jerusalem in this book is a symbol of the church. You know, the dispensationalists teach that one day the Jews of Palestine will rebuild the temple. You know, they've got already the architectural blueprints. They want to have a go at it as soon as they can. And the dispensation says, I will attempt to do this and that will precipitate Armageddon and Russia will come down from the north and, and ultimately the kings of the east and others will meet there in the valley of Megiddo and Armageddon will be fought and then Christ will come. That's literalizing the symbols of Scripture because all the symbols in this book are applied in a worldwide sense. Let me give you an illustration or two so this will become clear. Kindly look at the seventh verse of chapter 1. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Notice that last part. All kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now keep your finger in Revelation, but let's go back to where that's quoting from. Zechariah chapter 11 and beginning at verse 11. Zechariah is one of those little books 
it's very hard to find. You remember a boy was sent out to count the pigs. He came back to the farmer. He said, those pigs were, were moving so fast. I counted six of them, but the other one was too fast to count. Well, the little books of the Minor Prophets are like that. They're very difficult to count. Zechariah is the second last book of the Old Testament. Second last book. And look at chapter 11, if you would, of the second last book of the Old Testament. Here's the roots of that statement in Revelation. We've already said that Revelation is a mosaic of Old Testament passages. Uh, let's see. Sorry, it's chapter 12, not 11. Chapter 12. Verse 11. In that day there'll be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of Had Had Rimmon in the valley of Megiddo. The land shall mourn, every family apart, family of the house of David apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart, family of the house of Levi, and so it goes on, all the families that remain. Here it's talking about a battle in Palestine when there'll be a great mourning in Jerusalem and all the families related to Jerusalem, the literal city, are in mourning. But when we come to Revelation, it's applied to all the families of the earth. The symbols of the Old Testament are now made worldwide. Let's take another example. Look at chapter 3, if you would, and verse 5 of Revelation. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. That is an allusion to the white raiment that the priests wore the priests of Israel who worked at the sanctuary. But now in the New Testament it says every believer is counted as being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So what was once just the white garments of the priest now becomes the imputed righteousness symbolized by those garments. Garments in the Bible are a symbol of character. Christ gave his unblemished robe to his crucifiers that robe wore woven from the top to the bottom. Heavenly robe. He gave it to his crucifiers. He could have blotted them out by blinking. And to symbol how he gives his righteousness to us whose sins crucified him. So here, Revelation 3, 5, it takes a symbol. It goes back to Leviticus, where it talks about the priests being dressed in white robes. And what was local now becomes universal. Let's take one more example in chapter 6. Maybe two examples. In chapter 6 and beginning at verse 12, it talks about a sixth seal and a great earthquake, sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair, moon as blood, stars of heaven falling, heavens departing as a scroll. All of these verses, and your margins will give you the references, come from sources in books such as Isaiah and Amos and Joel, where those symbols applied to things happening in Palestine. But now, when they're applied in the book of Revelation to the great end of the world, comes symbolic of what's going to happen worldwide. We'll take one more. Revelation 17. <coughs> Look at this picture. Verse 3, a woman upon a scarlet coloured beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. Verse 5, mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now, Babylon, of course, captured Israel of old for 70 years. Here, this Babylon is drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So this is not ancient Babylon, which has gone long ago. It was predicted in the Old Testament Babylon will be the place for the spreading of tents. It will become a land of heaps, dust and ashes. So Babylon is gone. Now it's being used as a symbol of persecuting powers of Christians. The early Christians understood it first of the Roman Empire. To be a Christian was very dangerous in the first century. They were accused of eating their own children, which was a perversion of what the pagans knew about the Lord's Supper. Take, eat, this is my body. 
The pagans were verders, that said, oh, they eat their own children. So Christians were sometimes dipped in tar and set alight for festivals. Or they were put in skins of animals and let loose in the Colosseum arena. So it was very, very dangerous to be a Christian. So the early Christians read this and said, Babylon, that's the Roman Empire. And in later ages, the symbol was applied to other persecuting powers. During the Middle Ages, when church and state united, millions of people were burnt at the stake and tortured. When America was founded, Protestants persecuted Catholics. That's why you get the name Maryland. The only safe place in America for Roman Catholics was Maryland. Protestants persecuted the Catholics terribly. And the same Protestants used this verse to damn the Catholics. But it is a symbol of persecuting powers. Its final application will be when our chaotic world, in an endeavour to make peace, will weld religion with politics and persecute all who don't conform. But notice the local becomes the universal. The Jewish now applies to the Christian world. Now let me talk to you about the main key to the book of Revelation. We've talked about minor keys. What did it mean? The people who first got it. It's symbolic. The symbols are in the Old Testament. They're no longer local. Jewish things are made universal, made Christian, baptized. But here's the main clue. The main clue of this book is in the first verse and in the first line and in the first phrase. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Can you guess how many times Jesus is referred to in the first three chapters of Revelation? The first three chapters. You know, in the whole New Testament, he's mentioned on just about every page and approximately a thousand times, but just make your own guess. Don't say it aloud. In the first three chapters, 137 times. He's given 25 titles in this book. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. He's the faithful and the true witness. He's the creator of, uh, of the things of earth. Uh, he's the Lord God omnipotent. He is the Lamb. And you know, that hits my conscience because when I first read the book, I never saw the Lamb at all. I only saw that naughty lady on top of a dreadful beast. But the Lamb is mentioned here. How many times do you think? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-eight times. Four times seven. You know, this is a book of sevens. Genesis begins with seven, seven days, symbolic of the work of creation. It ends with fifty-four sevens. Fifty-four sevens. And he set forth as a lamb four times seven, twenty-eight times. Christ's experience is referred to over and over in this book. This book foresees the future through the lens of the cross of Christ. And this book even portrays Antichrist in imagery based on Christ's experience. Look with me for a moment at Revelation 13. The first few verses are pretty dreadful, a combination of the beastly beasts of Daniel, chapter 7, which and they worship the dragon, and it says in verse 5, they have power to continue 40 and 2 months. He opened his mouth and blasphemy against God, blaspheme his name. Verse 7 makes war with the saints and overcome them, has power over all kindred, sons and nations. So here's a picture of Antichrist. Combination of all those terrible symbols from Daniel 7. Allied to the dragon, the devil. And he makes war for 40 and two months. And has victory for 40 and two months. Do you remember how long our Lord ministered? Three and a half years. 40 and two months. So Antichrist also makes war ministers in his way, a bloody way, for 40 and two months. Christ has a, the deadly wound on the cross, is buried in the tomb, and then comes up again. Look at chapter 17. The 
verse 11, and the beast that was and is not even, he's the eighth, is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. As you study this passage, it's very mysterious. In the end of verse 8, it says, the beast that was, is not, and yet is. Well, you see, Christ was, and there's time when he was not in the tomb, and yet he still was, in the tomb, the divinity was quiescent, as in the womb. There's a real connection between the womb of Jesus and the tomb of Jesus. Jesus began his earthly form in a virgin womb, cared for by a just man called Joseph. He ends his earthly sojourn in a virgin tomb, belonging to a just man called Joseph. Forty days after his birth, our Lord ascended to the heaven, uh, he went up to the temple to be dedicated. Forty days after his death, he ascends to the heavenly temple to dedicate it. So when Revelation pictures Antichrist as the one that was, is not, yet is, a wound, a head wounded to death and it's healed, resurrection, it's saying Antichrist will ape Christ. Antichrist is not an atheist. Antichrist points to bad religion. The worst enemy of Christ is not the atheist. He's got nothing to offer. He has nothing to offer. You know, if you're an atheist, you have to believe that everything's a product of chance, including your atheistic thoughts. So how can you convince anyone of anything? See? If there's no God, if everything came about by chance... This brain wasn't made to think, it's just an accident. What a fluke to have a computer on our shoulders that can make sense of everything else. What a fluke. See? So the atheist has nothing to offer. Death for him is the end. So Antichrist is religious and he will counterfeit the Christ. He he makes war for 42 months. Then he's put to death. He is not. Then he has a resurrected form for the final attack on the church. So Christ is the key in this book even to Antichrist. Marvellous thing. We're going to take a break for ten minutes and then we'll see how not only the life of Christ but the teachings of Christ in the Gospels are expanded in Revelation. Let me leave you with this thought. I know you'll meditate on it in the next ten minutes. The whole book of Revelation is an expansion of one sermon of Christ. The Olivet Sermon. you find that in Luke 21. Mark 13, Matthew 24 and 25. The whole book of Revelation is an expansion of that. And that is an expansion of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. So, so it goes like this. Daniel 9, 24 to 27 predicted the first and second advents of Christ. Matthew 24 points forward to the cross, the end of the first advent, and the return and glory, first and second advent. And it's based on Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Revelation is based on the Olivet Sermon and it sees the future through the lens of the cross.